Greetings gamers, I'm Anto and today we're going to be talking about how to run a political game of D&D. So what do I mean when I say a political game? What do people think of when they think of a political game of D&D? They probably think of something like Game of Thrones, where the people in power are constantly scheming and plotting. Or they might think of a Cold War RPG where you play as agents who go undercover. The key thing in my mind that makes a political game is that the players are interacting with a lot of people who have power or who want power or who are trying to keep people from taking their power. The important part is that the players are playing an active role in that transfer of power between different parties. Think of it, the Game of Thrones isn't exciting because the readers or viewers know that the reach is rich in crops or that they know that the Iron Bank collects taxes. These things are all politics, but they aren't interesting in their own right. The readers get excited because they know if the Crown wants to march north to war, they're gonna need the Reach on side to provide food for the armies. So if the Reach turns on the Crown, that is a big deal. Readers and viewers of Game of Thrones get excited by the politics of it because they understand how one person doing one thing affects the wider world around them and how all these relationships feed into and play off one another. For the purposes of this video, we're gonna define politics and a political game as people who have power, what they do to keep power, and what they do to take power away from other people. And as I said, a political D&D game is one where the players have a lot of interaction with people in positions of power. That doesn't mean that the players have to work for a lord or a monarch or really work for anyone at all. It doesn't mean that they have to spend all their time running errands or serving as bureaucrats for the region that they're in. You can have power and be political without being the ruler. A thieves guild that controls a section of the King's Road and puts a tax on people that wish to pass. They have real power even though they're not in control of government. And the players interacting with that thieves guild or being hired to take down that thieves guild or having any sort of play with that power dynamic that the Thieves Guild hold, that would be playing a political game. You'd be helping the Thieves Guild take power, helping them keep it, or helping someone else take it away from them. So when we run a political game of D&D, we want to put our players behind the curtain. We want to let them see the key events that shape the course of nations or regions. We want to see that transfer of power happening before the players. In my mind, if you want a political game, something that makes the players feel like they're in Game of Thrones or that they're running something deeply political, the way to do that is with factions, plenty of factions. This, in my mind, is the best way to allow your players to interact with the politics of their world, because every faction will have its own goals, its own desires, its own motivations. Each faction will have allies and enemies, people that they trust and interact with, people that they could betray, people that they might lie to, people that might lie to them, and the interplay between all these factions for all these different elements is what makes a game feel like a political game. I've made a bunch of videos in the past talking about how to make different factions. I will leave links to them in the description below. But if you want something that's more concerned with the politics of court or something that's concerned with higher level politics, you're gonna need governments. And I have recently put out a video on building governments that you can see up here. It goes through the process of how to make more in-depth and interesting governments for your game. And it's a really good starting point before you start thinking about running a political game. In this video though, we're gonna focus on a much smaller scale example. We're gonna use the city of Azim from my desert nation of Ashk. Azim is a large merchant city with a huge market bazaar. I've made a video talking about the world building of Azim in the past, which I'll link up here as well, so that you can get some context on the region that we're gonna be playing around in today. But that's what we're gonna focus on, the power politics of Azim. So thinking about politics as how people gain power, keep power, and take it from others, we need to know who in Azim has currently got 
power. To start with, we have the Merchant Guild. They control trade in the city. You cannot legally trade in Azim without a pass given to you by the Merchant Guild. They run the local government and they definitely have power. Then we have the Tamin and the Dina Mal. These are the law enforcement of Azim. They're the local guards and the detectives. They might work for the government, for the Merchant Guild, but they have power in their own right. And then we have some individuals and some small businesses that have their own power. For example, we have Basin Al Hassan, who runs the local branch of the Ashk Trading Company. This is the company that brings almost all goods into and out of Ashk via the waterways. Basim isn't in a position of official power, but because he essentially controls the waterborne trade, he has a lot of practical power, so he would be a key player in a political game set in Azim. Then we need to think about who in the city wants power, who is going to be making strides to take power. For that, we start off with a couple of different mob organizations, some organized crime syndicates. And the two biggest in Azim are the Zilla and the Wolves of Jericho. These are two underground criminal syndicates that are making plays throughout the city and trying to gain power. And then like all of Ashk, Azim has a large slave population. So with the right organization and a leader, the slaves of Azim could be a powerful political force. And then we have the churches. Azim has two major churches within the city, a church dedicated to the sun goddess and a church dedicated to the goddess of death. And both of these churches would be making their own moves to gain power and spread influence throughout the city. Real world politics are messy. And if you're running a political game, you want to create a sense of that feeling of messiness and interwoven connections. And you want to make it so that everything feels just a little bit too complex. The real world and real world politics is a string of different connections and who knows how one or little act can have huge ripples on the wider world. And if you want to run a really political intrigue filled game, you want to get some of that sense of complexity into your game. And I think the best way to do that is to lay out your various factions in a sort of mind map and figure out how they all relate to each other. You can do that either on a piece of paper or with a variety of computer programs, but I am gonna use Serif Page Plus for this as it's what I'm most comfortable with. So let's jump over to Page Plus and we can work out how all the factions of Azim interweave with each other and set ourselves up for a really interesting political intrigue game. So we start off by laying out our factions in these bubbles on the page. You can see that we've got all of the different factions that we've talked about already laid out. And the next step is to work out what the relationships between all these factions are. And I like doing this in a mind map because it's a really visual way of thinking about it. And what we want to do is we want to draw lines between each of our factions. We want lines for a beneficial relationship and a line for a detrimental relationship. And you'll see as we go through, you can actually get quite complex with this. One side of a relationship might view it as beneficial, while the other side might view it as detrimental. So, for example, the Merchant Guild might view their relationship with the slaves as beneficial. They get use from the slaves, but obviously the slaves view their relationship with the Merchant Guild as detrimental. They are enslaved by these people. So by having the arrows moving to and from our factions and the interplay between them, we start to build this complex web of politics. So we're going to start out here. We're just going to draw a couple of quick lines for our beneficial and detrimental relationships and we're going to give them some colors. So we're going to go a nice bright red for our detrimental relationships and a nice vibrant green for our beneficial ones. And then what we want to start doing is drawing in those relationships. So using the Merchant Guild as an example, we want to draw a line between them and the slaves and then draw a line between the slaves and the Merchant Guild. And I'm just going to add some arrowheads to my lines here. And then by adding colour, you can immediately see the relationship that these two factions have. The Merchant Guild view the slaves as beneficial, the slaves view the Merchant Guild as detrimental. And going and doing this for every single faction in a region or in your game, for factions or people, 
is a great way to build up this complex web of politics. So once you've done that for all the factions or the people in your game, you'll end up with something that looks like this. And your first thought is probably, oh my God, that looks like such a mess and really complex. And you are right, but it needs to because politics is messy and confusing. And this is a really good representation of that confusion and that complexity. It looks really confusing at first, but once we dive into it, it all starts to become quite clear. Let's use the Ashk Trading Company and the Tamim, Dinamal, for example. You can see that the Ash Trading Company views their relationship with the Tamim as a detrimental one, but the Tamim has no relationship with the Ash Trading Company. Why might that be? Well, if you have a look, the Ash Trading Company has a relationship with the Zilla. Now, the Zilla are a organized crime syndicate. They are a mob. So they are probably moving black market materials into Azim through the Ash Trading Company. So the reason the Ash Trading Company has a detrimental relationship with the Tamim is because they know that at any point the Tamim might discover that they're moving in contraband goods and that would cause all sorts of problems for them. At the moment, the Tamim has no reason to suspect them, so they have no real relationship with the Ash Trading Company, more so than they do with anyone else in the city. What this mind map means in practical terms is that when our players arrive in the city of Azim and begin interacting with people, we will know how that will have ripple effect outwards. Let's say the players arrive in the city and start doing work for the Tamim or the Dina Mal. That means that we can assume that the organized crime syndicate the Ash Trading Company, they're not going to want to deal with the players because that's too much risk. The players are in with the Tamim and it's not worth exposing their illicit activities by working with the players. It will close off those avenues to the players. They might even make active enemies of the players. So the players might get to the city, start working with the Tamim, and they might find that some of the Zilla start attacking them because they are agents of the law enforcement. But conversely, maybe someone who works for one of the organized crime families might approach the players and say, look, we want to free the slaves. We know that you've been working with the Tamim. You have a bit of insider knowledge. We have heard you say that you're not fans of slavery. Will you help us free the slaves? The players might go, yeah, of course we want to free the slaves. we we'll create an uprising. That sounds awesome. Let's do it. But what the players don't know is that the Zilla actually have contacts with the Ashk Trading Company and they want to use the commotion of a citywide revolt to bring in some really dangerous illegal black market goods. And that is one of the ways that we can use this web, this mind map to really make more interesting stories. We can see how different relationships interact with each other and what different factions stand to gain from different things. Perhaps the mob have also made a deal with the Church of Koros, who they have a relationship with, to collect bodies from the streets during this uprising. So while the players are off freeing the slaves and thinking that they're doing an amazing thing, they've actually created a situation where this organized crime syndicate can really profit from it. They can bring in black market goods, they can get bodies for the Church of Koros, all the while the Tamim, who are their primary enemies, are concerned with trying to quell the slave uprising. From that one scenario, you could expand into an entire campaign arc as the players are contacted by different factions throughout the city and it all unfolds slowly over the course of many months as they do things for different factions that slowly set up this slave uprising. And it's only afterwards that they realize that they've been played by the mob, that the mob has gone, the Zilla have gone, and they've profited greatly from this while the players have put their lives at risk. Building these webs of relationships between people and factions and governments is going to make your world much more rich just in general and it's going to enable you to run a much more deeply political game. It allows you to at a glance know who has a relationship with whom, what those relationships are and how the players impact 
the world. So the players might approach the Church of the Avalites, start working with them. You can see that they don't have a good relationship with the Zilla or the Church of Koros, and it might shut off different quests. If you think of it a little bit like a video game where you have branching paths, and if you choose one path, it might close another. That's something that you can achieve with this complex array of relationships between different factions. Doing this will give your players that sense that they are in a Game of Thrones-esque world where everything is deeply political and everyone has an agenda and it will help them to feel like they are seeing behind the curtain of the politics of the world and impacting it in real meaningful ways, which is what you want if you're running a political game. That's all for this week, folks. I hope you enjoyed this video and it's got your brain fired up creatively and you go off and think about the politics of your world and how your factions and individuals relate to one another. I'd love to hear any tips you have for running political games down in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button. It really helps me out. It tells YouTube that this content is worth pushing in front of other people and helps bring new people to the channel. But until next time, happy gaming. Thanks for watching. If you're new here, make sure to subscribe to stay up to date with all my new releases. I release new videos every other Friday. You'll find more videos just over here. And if you enjoy what I do, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Just $5 a month gets you access to loads of extra content to use in your RPG campaigns. But until next time, happy gaming.